The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. And if we can also bring up the slide deck, that would be great. <clears throat> Jennifer, we might need just two minutes on that. Okay, no problem. As we're waiting for the uh, slide deck to be pulled up, just uh, want to remind everyone that this session is being recorded. Can you see the slides? Yes, I think we can see them now. Thank you. Yes. All right, we can go to the next slide. Um, wanted to start by going through our agenda and also um, highlighting a couple of key follow-up areas. Um, I want to start with clarifying that we've received a lot of feedback around dehabilitation um, and our FY24 focus areas. As we've discussed, the FY23 budget will adjust rates by the 4% COLA and the 4% supplemental budget, um, but our work around dehabilitation um, is continuing and will inform the FY24 budget at the end of this rate setting cycle. Um, we also received a request from Max to present um, an update of their data analysis on rate impacts. Um, and in response to this request, um, MDH is asking our rate setting consultants to assess and analyze the presentation, and that will inform the state's decision regarding the request to present. Um, in addition, moving forward, um, we will be providing a process for members to make requests for agenda topics for consideration by the co-chairs. Right, do you want to go on to the next slide? Um, just as always, a reminder that this advisory group is part of a new structure um, which comes from Secretary Schrader and Deputy Secretary Simon's commitment to the development of adequate and sustainable rates that promote the vision and mission of the DBA community. Um, the commitment members have made to participate ensures an open and transparent process to review rates. Next slide, please. So members were sent an email with meeting minutes on May 13th. Um, and to clarify following feedback from members, we've made some additional updates to page eight of the minutes. Can we bring up those? Yeah. Donna, may I pull up my share screen? This is Emily and my apologies. Yeah, let me give you... Um... Let me give it the screen to you. Hold on. It will be just for a few minutes here. Okay, I'm not sure what folks are able to see. Can you see my 
meeting minutes. It's your desktop right now. No, that's just yeah, it's your desktop. Just the desktop. Well, that's not helpful. Um, Let's do this. How about that? Is that better? There they are. There they are. Okay. Um, it's actually on page nine of the um, meeting minutes when Robert's uh, Robert White is talking about the application of the supplemental budget. To clarify. Um, he, it's on, you can see the highlighted text here for the additional, it's the additional language. Um, it says if the in-process rate work discussed today identifies rate increases beyond fiscal year 23 budget, this will inform the fiscal year 24 DBA budget development. He had said that, it just wasn't captured in the meeting minutes. Right. Um, so with that change, um, as chair, I will make a motion to approve the minutes. Do we have a number to second? Second, Karen Lee. All right. Um, any discussion? This is Scott Hollandworth. I, I I would wonder in the future, excuse me, if under next steps, we could identify some things um, because I, 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 I'm i confused on the the long conversation that we had, including, you know, the transportation and you, and, and you all sent out a, you know, a draft proposal on how we could track transportation and, and we all had comments on, golly, is that going to work, you know, and um, and then we talked about other things related to the day of allocation rates. And yet it seems like it kind of is falls off the page at that point. And I would just wonder if in the future under a next step somewhere in there, um, you could capture a little bit as we're gonna we're gonna get back to the committee on X, Y, and Z. Um, that that would that would be helpful for me. Okay, we'll definitely take that feedback for sure. Yeah, I, I would second Scott's uh, thought there. Some type of a parking lot category where items from one meeting can translate or at least flow through to the next meeting. Okay. For last month's minutes, um, all in favor, say aye. 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 And anyone opposed? All right. You've approved the minutes, so thank you for that. And next slide, please. So at our last meeting, um, we committed to developing bylaws so that everyone will have the same expectations and guidance established to clarify roles and responsibilities of advisory group members, including the MDH representatives, and also review the practices of the advisory group as a public engagement tool bound by the Maryland Open Meetings Act. Um, the bylaws that we've drafted are currently under review by um, MDH Assistant Attorney General, but we did want to share with you a summary of the proposed structure as well as the draft language um, to support the RREG members' interest um, in how we kind of define engagement. Um, so can we go to the next slide, please? So this slide includes the draft language section of the bylaws that is specific to communication and engagement outside of the RREG. We know there is a collective interest and um, opportunities for these engagements, but that we also must uphold our commitment as an advisory group to a public access and participation. Um, I'll read the current language and then 
take any feedback from the group. Uh, so what we're proposing is contract contacts of an administrative nature for validation or fact finding between the MDH rate setting consultants and or state leadership with members of the RAG is permissible, but must be clearly defined in advance and limited to the defined scope or topic. A summary of these administrative contacts will be provided at the following RAG meeting and will include the date and time of the contact as well as those present during contact. State leadership can provide status updates and publicly available information to groups or individuals outside the RAG. If state leadership is given recommendations pertaining to rate setting outside the RAG, that information shall, shall subsequently be shared with the RAG. So any thoughts, comments? Um, we'll also certainly take comments if you think of things later on as well. Uh, Scott again, you stated that you will take comments later. I um, want to make sure we don't cross lines there. Um, how would we submit comments later? It's too much for me to really dig into right now. All right, we'll get back to the team and talk about providing a way for you to do that. Probably kind of like we've solicited feedback with other things that we've, we've done kind of to a central um, point. Good. Any initial feedback? Oh, Jennifer, and um, this is Karen Adams Gilchrist with Providence. Um, will we have an opportunity to see the full? um set of bylaws yes um like, like i said we're, it's currently under review with our aag at the moment and once that is done um, the intent is to share the whole document with the group thank you sure. jennifer <clears throat> it's laura i have a question um the uh i don't know if here or anywhere else if there's any guidance or, or there are going to be any requirements for how um someone requests the opportunity clearly defines in advance the scope topic is that going to be um spoken to or is that something that you know will there will be some flexibility around that is a good question um I think we'll have to take that back. So I guess you're just to make sure I understand your question. Like if you, you want to know more and our but what we think by something being clearly defined in advance and limited in scope and kind of what sorts of communication that allows for. Well, I guess I would <clears throat> just I hope that it wouldn't be so burdensome to make it, you know, like right. Uh, at least two weeks of notice and you know fair okay you know what i mean that there's some flexibility to send an email or you know something mm -hmm. okay yeah we'll we'll make sure we we capture that and kind of make it make it clear in the final document and um this scott again this is this doesn't address contact between rag members i don't does it it's between the it's right between... it does not okay so i mean i guess i would just remind everyone that um the maryland open meetings act does have provisions that kind of define what a meeting is and if we meet that threshold it needs to be open to the public um, one of the major you know, um, elements there is the number of people involved. So, I mean, obviously, this is just me thinking offhand, not actual legal advice of any sort. But I think if like, two people were having a conversation, it would be fine. What we don't want to do is get to the point where it's so many people talking to each other that it looks like a meeting happening outside of a public meeting. 
And I think some of those um, details around quorum and such um, should be in the bylaws. Any Jennifer, it's Chris. Questions? Sure, sure. Quick question. Do the bylaws uh, anywhere address the uh, work group's ability to be able to provide information or present information, the timing that would be required for us to submit documentation yeah. or a presentation? Yep, absolutely. There's going to be um, a clear process behind that. Okay. Is there any discussion about that time frame? I mean, you know, the ability to get something two, three days in advance and still have approval to present at the meeting versus two weeks? So it's going to be what we really need enough time to be able to look at it and be able and update the agenda appropriately. So and we try to have the agenda posted about a week in advance. I'm forgetting offhand what we have um, in the draft version at the moment. Um, but so I guess is your concern that you want to be able to suggest things sooner to the meeting date? Uh, just to have that flexibility. I mean, if we had some mm -hmm. important information that we were able to share and it was only a day or two before to table mm -hmm. that until it's reviewed and not be able to present in a timely fashion could be an issue. Just some flexibility. Definitely that feedback. Thank you. Any other comments? All right. Um, so thank you everyone for your comments. And I will now turn the presentation over to Optimus and Hilltop to share um, a summary of the FIAT report. Good morning or good afternoon. This is Steve Schramm with Optimus. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of background about the FIAT, the Fiscal Impact Analysis Tool. Um, this is something that uh, is um, a very important tool. It allows uh, MDH and DDA to receive feedback from the provider community about rate changes. Um, we understand, as um, for instance, Chris mentioned uh, two meetings ago, that um, it has some limitations because of the timing of the information. And so an example of one of the limitations is that we are not able to sit with each one of the providers as they fill out the fiat uh, and so there may be varying assumptions um, between and among providers when they're completing um, the tool. Another um, important consideration for us as we are reviewing the information um, that uh, comes out of the, uh, the fiat is that we know some of the rates have changed since the fiat was released. Um, now, in general, those um, have resulted in increase um, to the rates, but that is something that we need to be um, consider, considering as we review uh, the information. What we're really trying to use this information is to look at um, projected revenue under LTSS Maryland in relation to the PCIS2 revenue. And as we've talked about in the past, there are some differences in service definitions and units that we'll need to adjust for as we think about the information um, that we get. So um, as um, we go through this process, keep in mind um, that we hear your feedback that this is not a perfect source of information. Um, we also um, hear your feedback that um, we need to continue to improve the fiat uh, process, but we also recognize that this is an important step in 
establishing a feedback loop with the provider community um, so that we can get uh, a data point on the rates moving forward and how it impacts the provider at the provider level. So before I hand it off to the Hilltop team, any questions or comments on the fiat approach? Steve, it's Chris. Uh, not necessarily on the approach, but just the prior request for the updated fiat tool with new rates so that providers can con continue to maintain those projections. And uh, just a, kind of a follow up to that, I would think it would be beneficial that each time we issue a new set of rates, that we also distribute a new fiat tool, at least until further further notice. Um, I appreciate the feedback. Chris, are you okay if I um, ask for feedback from the rest of the group uh, as to that comment? Sure. So I'm gonna um, ask other members of the advisory group, is that um, a, a an expectation that you all are comfortable with from a, from a rate setting perspective, Optimus is the rate setting consultants, would very much um, like to have uh, that uh, ongoing um, feedback loop with updated information. We would see it as valuable, but I want to understand the operational impact that it may have on the provider community. Steve, let me, let me clarify. I was not requesting that a full fiat tool be assessed each and every time for every provider, just that the provider have the tool so they can manage their end and if there's a way to pull that data, if somebody is doing it, but not as a requirement. Absolutely. This, this is Robert. So I think, you know, what we can commit to, uh, Chris, uh, to your point is taking the fiat tool and um, go ahead and, and get the LTSS rates updated to reflect uh, since we are about a month and a half from having new rates, uh, we can load that tool, which will the July 1 rates and um, uh, provide a link to its location for those providers who are interested. Um, and again, this is uh, for use internally to, to make business decisions and not that we will necessarily ask Hilltop and or Optimus to do an analysis after each iteration. This is Laura. I think providers would appreciate that because they have asked for updated tools um, with the April 1 rate. So I think providing that for July 1 and any other iterations would be great. I would agree as well. We've filled out the tool a number of times uh, because of being early adopters. And I would say, Rather, for us, rather than having a new tool, I wish the current tool were unlocked so that we could put the changes in ourselves and not have to put new data in. Um, so at least if the, the tool that we, if we could get a tool that's unlocked where we could plunk the rates into um, when they change, that would be preferable to me than a whole new tool. Okay, we can take that um, under advisement. Any other comments before I hand it off to Hilltop? All right, uh, hearing none, let's go to the next slide. And um, Hilltop, you are, you're up. Great, thanks, Steve. <laughs> Jennifer, how's my audio? Jennifer, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Morgan Henderson. I'm a data scientist at uh, Hilltop. And uh, along with Dr. Ian Stockwell, who could not be here today, uh, we uh, conducted analysis on the fiat submissions that we received earlier this year. Um, so the, the highlights and general points of the analysis we conducted are presented on the slide that you can see. Uh, we conduct, we analyzed 84 
fiat submissions that's from 84 separate providers and we found that on average provider revenue is projected to increase by a little over 18 percent under the switch from pc is2 rates to an ltss maryland rate structure and this is largely driven by increases in the community living group home revenue uh, while there is projected to be an average increase in revenue not all providers are projected to experience uh, a, a positive revenue change and in our analysis uh, 15 out of 84 providers that we included in our study uh, were projected to actually lose revenue under the switch to the LTSS Maryland rate structure. So we dug into this to, to better understand uh, any potential drivers for this and we uh, discovered that there is a negative relationship between the percentage of PCIS2 revenue from meaningful day services and the percentage change in total revenue, meaning that providers that uh, provide a higher fraction of their services as meaningful day, uh, they tend or they are projected to experience lower revenue increases and sometimes revenue decreases. Next slide, please. So we would certainly like to note uh, some limitations to this analysis. Um, in addition to, to what Steve mentioned about the rates having changed since we received these fiat reports, uh, the providers that uh, responded and, and that we analyzed, these are not a random or necessarily universal sample. So, so the, the findings that we, that we found apply to the, the providers we looked at. They don't necessarily generalize to all providers. The second limitation uh, that we'd like to note is that fiat submissions are, are self-reported and unaudited. Um, so we conducted a data integrity check prior to conducting our analysis. And when we found um, kind of little glitches in the templates, we corrected them where possible, but we didn't conduct a systematic search for these. And so uh, that, that, uh, that, that's a caveat that we'd like to note. Uh, and then finally, uh, as you all know, fiat submissions, they do not contain cost information. So this means that a change in revenue does not necessarily mean that there's an associated change in, in net financial position. So a decrease in projected revenue doesn't necessarily mean a decrease in, in net income, profit margins, or, or any of the above. So we, we were only able to look at revenue for this. Uh, and uh, Jennifer, that's, that's all we have, and happy to take any questions. Hi, this is uh, Karen Lee. I'm wondering if you noticed any trends around utilization in um, specifically in the uh, people who had a decrease or not as much of a gain or a loss in revenue from the meaningful day. Uh, so we were we were kind of limited in what what we could look at um, just in, in terms of what the what the spreadsheets contained. Um, you know, of course, providers vary a lot in size, um, in the utilization of their populations. And so this was more of a higher level analysis uh, and this kind of digging into the, the, the meaningful day. So we didn't, we did not specifically look at that. This is Laura. Um, I, I'm, I guess I'm just really wondering if you if there's any more analysis beyond kind of what you presented on the last slide because that's i don't i mean it's i guess we kind of knew that i'm glad that the you know hilltop was able to confirm that but i'm just wondering whether there's any more analysis you have yeah so laura and and and, and carolee um chris uh, we'll also do an overview of the analysis that Optimus did, and so that might answer some of your questions. Can you go back to the previous um, slide? Do you know out of the um, 15 out of the 84 providers projected for the loss revenue, do you know if they were day only providers? 
so they were um, they 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 provided quite a high proportion of meaningful day services. Um, so it's it, it it was a mix of those fifteen. It, it's not the case that all fifteen only provided meaningful day okay. services, but it was it was disproportionately uh, high in meaningful day services. Yeah. And what about the um, percentage and change of revenue? Do you have that separated by meaningful day versus residential? Uh, no, we do not currently. Yeah, that was a question I was going to ask as well. I think, you know, it's, I feel like, at least from our perspective, we've been pretty clear that each service, and I feel like DDA has agreed with this, that each service should be, <clears throat> excuse me, financially viable in and of itself. You can't, we, we are not, uh, it would not um, support people's needs to have agencies have to offset losses in one area by gains in other areas for a whole host of reasons, um, including the fact that not every provider provides every service. So I think it would be really helpful to have a sense of what you saw in the fiats for community living group home by itself, and then <clears throat> um, certainly meaningful day as a whole. And you know, there are within Meaningful Day, you know, big concerns, I think, in each of the three areas, um, probably biggest in day hab and uh, employment, but there are concerns in um, CDS as well. And I would, this is Chris, I would certainly second Laura's point. You know, the thought that the uh, 69 or that we're up 18.2%, is that a 30% gain in residential and a 10% loss in day like we think it may be? So based, yeah. I guess based on that feedback, is is there an opportunity that you will go back and do a deeper dive into individual services? Karen, this is Robert again. Um, so again, we have enlisted the help of Optimus to take the Hilltop analysis and, and kind of pull that back a little more. Um, I know that they are still in the process of doing that, um, but they are prepared to share some of their initial findings. Um, <clears throat> based on the report that did come back from Hilltop, I believe there was approximately 21 providers who were receiving 100% of their revenue from PCIS2 for meaningful day services. And of the 21, nine of those providers were showing uh, losses, um, which means that a majority of them were showing gains. And um, what was interesting to note is of the nine, two of them, have volunteered uh, to be, become part of the pilot. But I don't want to rain on Chris's parade any longer, and we'll go ahead and turn it over to him. If I could just ask one more. Um, so I would imagine the data is there, because that's how we came to bullet number four on the screen that's in front of us. So I guess it's just a little more detailed sharing that. And then I guess the other question I would have is, knowing having run the comparison for my own agency for the pieces rate versus LTSS, I'm just curious if the providers that were day only that filled out the fiat, fiat if they indeed did it correctly and not assuming 100% utilization, which in the beginning when the fiat came out, we do know that providers are looking at filling it out that way, which is very unrealistic. So that would only that would be my only other question is if the data in fact that they ran is going to actually be real for them. Um, and just one other just quick question about the you said you um, analyzed eighty four submissions is that's the number that was submitted eighty four were submitted. Uh, we excluded um, a handful because of data errors uh, that we could not comfortably correct. So uh, I believe we received submissions from 89 providers and we analyzed 84. Thank you. And 
This is Maria. Can you tell us like how many providers in total there are and um, or percentage of revenue? Just getting a sense of what proportion this might be of as a representative sample. So I'm, yeah, I do not have that number off the top of my head. I, I would defer to uh, you know, Steve or the, or the, the Optimus team. Okay. And I guess my other question is, there was a lot of detail in the fiat, um, also by um, geography. Did you um, have an opportunity to, to drill in or is there a reason why, you know, uh, yeah, you couldn't drill in a little bit more than just top level? Um, were there any sort of credibility or concerns or numbers providers? You know, you mentioned 21 providers that are meaningful day only. Um, were there providers that provide both residential and meaningful day that you know, gave us more comfort that that's a representative sample? Uh, so I think the goal for the Hilltop team was to kind of look at the data kind of as a whole and and try to make sense of what we're seeing at, at a high level before uh, doing any kind of further deep dives. And, and again, we're kind of working in coordination with, with Optimus and, and so they may, they, I know they they did do a deeper dive. Um, so uh, I, again, I, I defer to them, but uh, I can certainly take any feedback uh, back to Ian Stockwell. We can circulate uh, internally and uh, try to accommodate. Okay. So at this point, why don't we move on to that next slide that's up on the screen now, um, and Chris, your your presentation, and on that we will certainly continue to take questions about the the fiat um, on any of the slides about it once you've heard that additional information. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, we appreciate that. Um, so we have been able to take a look at the fiats. Uh, we are kind of still in process of, of trying to get into some of that more nuanced information, uh, the same kind of questions that you all have been asking. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we started looking at was uh, for day providers uh, specifically, um, we tried to do uh, kind of an average of what it looked like uh, per person per day um, in terms of total hours uh, when we're looking at 15 minute units. And there's definitely some other things going on that there are milestone um, milestone services and monthly services, but we're trying to you know kind of hone in specifically on those 15 minute um, meaningful day services, so day habilitation, as well as CDS, and I believe there's some employment there. Um, so uh, we'll just kind of keep that in mind, um, those nuances that, that Hilltop uh, kind of mentioned and those limitations. Um, but in what we're seeing is uh, there's a positive correlation between those average daily hours served per person um, for day habilitation, um, or sorry, for meaningful day, and uh, the revenue impact. Um, so that we're seeing providers uh, showing a projected reduction in revenue, um, you know, like uh, like we heard from um, Dr. Henderson, uh, they, those tended to be more focused on meaningful day services. Uh, but what we also noticed is that providers that averaged about four hours or more of meaningful day services uh, per person per day. Um, that they tended to have revenue increases and sometimes uh, more significant revenue increases. Um, and we looked at, you know, what would this look like if we were to adjust some of those low hours to uh, match some of the policy expectations, um, you know, moving forward. And nearly all of the providers uh, in that case would see an increase in revenue. And again, there's some some detail here. We're still kind of working through things a little bit. But just to give you guys kind of a picture, if we look at the next slide, um, this is a, a graph showing uh, some of the, the preliminary impacts from, from the first uh, set of, I think, 15 providers that we saw that were losing revenue or, or um, ones that had more significant day uh, revenue. So we can uh, you know, provide a little bit more detail and a little more sophistication as we have a little more time with this tool. But um, this is essentially what we're seeing. If you go from left to right, uh, this is kind of the average hours per person per day of meaningful day uh, services that they're offered. And uh, if you go, you know, from the bottom to the top, that's the percent change to the revenue that we're seeing for specifically for day habilitation. 
And so what we're seeing here is, again, that four hour mark is, is a little bit kind of a, a keystone where everything to the left of that tends to be negative or flat revenue and everything to the right of that tends to be positive. Um, so what we're seeing is providers that were offering uh, six hours of service a day or, or five hours of service a day and will continue to do that, or at least that's how they filled out the tool, uh, they would see a revenue increase. The providers that filled out the tool um, showing that they would have two hours of service a day um, or three hours of service a day, those ones would tend to see a decrease. So again, we're still trying to look into this and get a little bit more information, um, provide a little bit more detail there. Um, I think that you guys have asked some really great questions, uh, and I think those are some things that we'd like to provide you know, additional uh, data points that we can share with you. Um, but this is essentially what we're seeing uh, as we look through it. So um, if we go to the next slide real quick. Can, and can then... you wait on this slide for a second, Chris? Sure. Uh, so in the future, for, for my uh, purposes, I'd rather see this in units since we're going to units and not hours. Um, I think um, if, if we're going to go into units in LTSS, so 24 units is what you're saying, and that at uh, people are starting to see an increase in revenue when they get to 16 units a day, and people and going up after 16 units a day, right? So, um, so there may be people in our experience that are some days are 16 and some days are 24 and some days are, you know, so the the units change, correct? But that was not you couldn't reflect that really. It was a in the fiat you were looking at kind of an average over uh, over the year. Right, exactly. Okay. So when people averaged less than 16 units per day, or whatever that turns out to be per year, there was a loss. The other thing, I, and it might be just kind of a, a nuance, is um, because what we're trying to do, I understand, in the in the way that we're currently doing our person-centered plans as well as our services is that people may have stacked funding. And so they may not have all their, all their services in one location like this. So they may have a variety of services. So they could have 16 units here, but they could also have done discovery that day, or they could have gone to employment that day or something like that. And we don't really have a way of, the fiat didn't, didn't flush that out at all. Yeah, I think that's, um, there's certainly limitations like that. Um, what we're trying to do is account for if those individuals had um, monthly or milestone services that may be, uh, you know, there was some daily hours that were utilized there rather than the 15 minute units, um, trying to account for things like that. So uh, we're still kind of in process, but um, if there are any, uh, any things that you would like us to show in terms of that, um, you know, any ways that we can kind of tease that information out that you think is useful, uh, you know, feel free to share those with us. Um, you know, we know that this isn't a perfect way of looking at things, but this is uh, kind of using the data that's available to us to get a better insight um, with uh, with what we can. It's, by the way, it's a great, it's a great visual chart. Thanks. Chris, I have a, I have a question. Um, I was, first of all, I want to make sure I'm understanding it. So, the the kind of dotted line the more solid line um that is the dividing line for providers that gained versus lost revenue is that correct um so the the y-axis going up and down on the left is uh the percentage of revenue gained versus loss so um, kind of that 0% would be that cutoff. Anything above that would be a gain. Anything below that would be uh, a loss. That dotted line that goes through them all is just um, kind of the, the trend uh, if you were to kind of collapse all these to a trend function. Uh, so it just kind of shows the, the average um, uh, correlation. OK, it just doesn't, it doesn't, when I look at that, it doesn't look as 
kind of simple to me as what you said in terms of the impact of providing more hours. Um, so I don't know, maybe I just need to look at it a little longer, but, um, you know, I still see a, you know, fair number of people who are, oh, you know what? Yeah. Okay. So when you look at the zero line, I get it. Yeah, Laura, this is Steve. It, the The way it, it helped for me was um, look at the furthest right hand blue dot, which is um, right on the zero percent line, uh, and it's just to the right hand side of the six. So what that's saying is they're um, slightly above a zero percent change in total revenue. Then. Um, find the blue dot that is uh, the highest on the chart, um, and that uh, is almost at the 100% increase line. And if you look, it's almost at the five and a half um, hours of um, service line. So any um, dot that is above the 0% line uh, will be someone who has seen a positive change in total revenue that they are projecting. Remember, this was the comment that this is a projection, an estimate of going forward, and so it won't be uh, perfect. But um, clearly what you see is the bulk of the individuals are um, projecting a um, positive uh, increase to their revenue are on um, the right-hand side of the four hours or more. Right, thank you. I, 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 I've got it now. Um, it does raise questions, though, about it would be interesting to know why, you know, there are such significant um, differences between that high point just below five and a half hours and the, you know, the provider that's just past six, it just raises questions for me about how much is driven by, um, you know, the uh, matrix score that it's the people are being, you know, in PCIS2, um, whether those are folks who have higher intensity support needs or, you know, kind of how that's playing out. I realize we don't really have that data at the moment, but it does raise those questions. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, one of the things, uh, for instance, specifically with this that we've seen is um, I believe that provider that's very high, close to the 100% increase, uh, was largely or entirely providing CDS services. And I think those are ones that, uh, that those rates tended to get bumped a little bit higher. Um, so this would you know include the cds the rehabilitation some of those employment services and i think some of the the uh, kind of movement up and down uh relative to the trend line depends on that provider's specific mix of those services what they offer um one limitation that we have here is if we're comparing revenue to revenue we have the revenue for meaningful day in the past but we don't have for example the revenue for cds in the past so we can't do like a cds to cds and a day have to day have kind of comparison so we're we're kind of limited to look at just meaningful day overall but i think uh, exactly what you're saying we're trying to see if there are some sort of conditions that may uh, you know, move providers towards uh, one way or the other based on um, that provider's specific situation, whether it be um, those matrix scores or the, that mix of services that they offer, anything like that. So this is something that we're still kind of in process. I know you guys have had a lot of, a lot of great questions. Uh, we hope to provide some more additional details there. Um, but I think that's that's just kind of the general idea of where we're at right now. I just wanted to kind of bring everyone up to speed what we're seeing. Chris, it's Chris. Uh, just want to make two points, really. One, you're looking at the majority of the providers that are projecting, you know, four four and a half hours or less. Within that group that's a four or less, and we're talking about considering the impact of the different services, like you said, CDS. I think there's value in looking at the impact of the makeup of the individuals within the service. 
if if a provider is pulling four or less in day program and they're seeing a gain, it's more likely than not that they've got a heavy one to one or two to one load that's supporting the other individuals who are are receiving the less supports. So I think if you look at the group that's above zero and less than four, it's either going to be CDS or they've got a bunch of one to ones. And I think that dynamic uh, comes into play. You don't want a situation where a day provider uh, is able to show a positive gain when they have, you know, because they have significant one-to-one -one supports. In other words, the one-to-one -one supports essentially are in the same position of supporting now the individuals uh, that have less needs. We don't want to be in that spot either too. You don't want providers to have to pick and choose. I'm going to take a one-on-one -on -one so I can survive or whether I can serve an individual that does not have that level of need. That's an excellent point, Chris. So in the interest of time, I'd like to move on to our next topic that we'll definitely take back all of your feedback on the additional aspects of the fiat data that you would like to um, see more analysis on. Can it, uh, this is Greg. Can I ask a general question before we move on? Um, specific to all the data that was, was just shown and the report that came from, from Hilltop, <clears throat> if I was in DDA's shoes, I would be concerned but I'm not really sure how concerned to be until we actually start seeing what real utilization looks like once people are in LTSS. And I know that a big topic in prior meetings has been around the day have rates and that those are things that, um, you know, are, are, being, are being looked at. I'm just wondering if there is a game plan for how DDA and, and our, you know, and our folks that are supporting this transition are going to be able to look at data in real time as organizations make this change into LTSS to see if, you know, it's really gonna be okay, or you know what, it's really not gonna be okay, and we can't wait a year for everybody to crash and burn to figure out how we're gonna fix this thing. So it's just, a, my concern is more, we're not gonna know what utilization is until people actually start utilizing it but how quickly can changes be made if we get into this thing a month or two? I would be concerned when I see something that says almost 20% of providers think they're going to be losing money. And when you think about what the environment has been like, even if you're breaking even money wise, the way inflation is killing people right now and how the world and the marketplace has changed, there are significant headwinds that are gonna to need to be dealt with in a rather quickly or timely basis. And I think there's a lot of there's a lot of bandwidth and there's a lot of collective intelligence on this group to help navigate that. But I don't think we want to just walk into a meeting two or three months down the road going, yeah, it's it's as bad as we thought, or hey, we don't have anything to worry about. I think we want to be prepared as much as possible for both of those scenarios for us to move quickly if we need to. So I'm just wondering how DDA is, is looking at that whole kind of big picture issue. Robert, can you speak to that? Hello, folks, can you hear me? Yeah. Sure. Uh, you know, so, so obviously, you know, those are some, some great and valid points that you, you make, Greg, um, and the things that, that we keep, you know, in the tops of our mind every time we um, have internal meetings re related to, to, to programming and policy, as, as well as rate development. Um, I don't have any uh, solid answers to give you today during during this call, but um, I just you know want to make make sure you all are, are know that you know we're not tone deaf and we are aware of some of the challenges um, that our providers are facing, um, especially you know as we enter this this post public health emergency and um, where utilizations will, will finally land. Where will they ever? back to where they were pre-pandemic and, 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 and things like that. So we're, you know, part of this process and, and working with you all 
um, and the way this is structured is so that we can collaborate and try to figure these things out together. Can I just add real quickly, and I, and I you know, defer to Greg on this as well. I know that when we went into LTSS um, as an early adopter, we changed our practice as we started to watch what was happening with billing. And so I think it's one thing to be on the side of, of this where you're speculating, which is important, don't get me wrong, I recognize that, but we have the ability as independent businesses to change our business practices and to be able to say to families or to people, you know, I, I lose money when I only work with you two hours a day and I'm really sorry about that. Um, I need to get up to four hours a day to work with you. Otherwise, I can't afford the staff person that you want that you've chosen and that you want to work with. So as businesses, we have the ability to change our business practices. I mean, I know that there is some situations where people might have such significant needs that they don't have the ability to do that, or, or we might have to change how we do those services. But in, in our personal experience, and I think I've heard my colleagues uh, from the EAG, we've changed our practices. And certainly one practice we've changed is our finance department and our programs are talking way more regularly about uh, about this so that they we can do course correction um, because it is a different model of service did you find that greg yeah karen i i, I totally agree with what you're saying my, my only caveat to that is yeah i mean i don't think i don't think any provider can 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 take a position that i just want to keep doing things the way that i've always done it and dda has got to figure out how to make that work for me I don't think any provider should be taking that position. But I also think that as, especially for my colleagues that are primarily day service oriented, um, there's, there's headwinds here and there's concerns here and there's value issues here as well. And so all I'm suggesting is that, yes, I think you have, you have there's always the opportunity for us to look at, at changes to our business model. We don't want changes to our business model to in any way change the values that we bring to the system each day. We do not want to say, yeah, well, this is this is how DDA set it up. So I'm going to work with all of the people that fit into this box. But the people that don't, I can't afford it. So they're going to have to look somewhere else. I, I know we all believe that. Yeah, um, all I'm saying is that, you know, I, I think that there's there's a there's a certain amount of angst in the provider community around the day supports right now and what that's going to look like with 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 where we're heading and all i'm suggesting is that we do everything we got a lot of really good people on this call and a lot of great people listening to this call that that we don't take a siloed approach to that and say okay well we know that's a challenge so we're going to look at that a year from now Maybe we don't have to look to at it from a year from now when we get into looking at the actual data and it makes sense, but maybe we do. And I'm just suggesting that we prepare together to make sure that the people that we support aren't going to be jeopardized in any way, shape or form because they've already been jeopardized through COVID by our capacity to provide supports. I don't lose, I don't lose sleep about what we're doing at Penmar. I lose sleep about what we're not doing because we don't have the team members to do it. And, and so what I'm suggesting is that we just take a very aggressive approach that we don't want to have the business model concerns in any way overtake the important value of why we're all in business in the first place. And, and I think that, like I said, none of us would disagree with that statement, but I think there's a certain intentionality to, to being able to look at, okay, how are these how are these providers doing one month into their conversion, two months into their conversion with Meaningful Day? What does that look like? What do their day habs look like? What is the data showing us so that as we come out post pandemic, it may be unrealistic to get up to six hours a day in the first three months or the first six months, but maybe two years from now that, that that's that's possible. What do we do in the meantime when people could be at risk of going out of business. That's my only reason for bringing this up is I just want us to be very, very smart about looking at that, that whatever data is available to us, looking at it quickly and making really good decisions about how we're gonna manage that 
over the course of the next you know year or two. So I'm going to stop talking because I'm you know I wasn't on the agenda. But um, uh, I would agree with you, Greg, 100%. And I think the reality is, I mean, you know, most of us on this call have been in this service for a very long time. And my business model, my business practice is person-centered. It's individualized. And so I need a system that can pay to support person-centered planning and individualized services. And there are many reasons why people choose or are only able to participate two hours a day versus six hours a day. And that it's intermittent for some folks due to medical, family, transportation, where they live. It just depends, mental health. Um, and so it is, it is hard because when we keep talking about the day program rate, you know, the, the business model term keeps coming up. And I, these are people we're supporting. These are people who are counting on us for their supports. And in some areas, some of these providers that we're speaking of, probably some of the 15 that showed up on the statistics there on the chart, they're the only provider that might even support those folks. Um, so very passionate about that piece as most of the people on the call know. So it's just something that deserves, those people deserve a lot more time and discussion on this rate issue. And I, can I just jump in and say one other thing on this, which is that, um, you know, the whole point <laughs> to hourly and you know 15 minute unit billing was to create more flexibility for the people we support and while it is certainly fine to expect that a provider community will learn and adapt and change business practices in order to be able to function in a new um you know fee payment system that's fine but when it becomes that you have to change your business model and you know kind of it, it only works financially if you you know provide a minimum number of hours that's really moving backwards from you know the values and um in stated goals of this entire rate system so we definitely appreciate everyone's feedback if we're going to get to some actions that we can take to address all these concerns, we need to move along to the other items in our agenda. So I think at this point, I would like for um, Chris to take us to the next slide, please. Sure, so Jennifer, this is Steve. I'll, I'll take the next slide just to move us along since we are behind. The idea, um, we, we added that um, slide just to say that um, we set uh, the rates based on um, policy, um, and so uh, that's what we're trying to reflect. I'm going to hand off um, the next slide to Leslie so that she can, um, as um, Jennifer said, move us forward with the fiscal year 24 um, focus areas for the rate setting. Steve, Steve, it's Chris. My apology. Could you say what you just said again? You said you're setting rate. I, I missed that last line. I'm sorry. Sure. So our rates are set based on policy. Optimus doesn't set policy. Um, we set rates based on the policy that is established by MDH and DDA. Can Can you clarify what you mean by your, the, the policy is driving how we're setting the rates? I mean, the policy is driving how we apply the rates. I thought that the, the BRIC calculation, the BRIC component, the BRIC philosophy is how we were coming to the rate. Maybe I'm not so, interpreting what you're saying. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, we just wanted to be clear and say um, the policy um, is established and then we set rates to mirror that policy. We do not set rates and then go back and say, let's establish policy to match these rates. All right, Leslie, do you want to talk us through this slide? Um, sure, thank you. Um, so last meeting, we talked through some um, priorities. There's been that priority list slide that's been going around every meeting, and we were able to narrow it down to these 
um, priorities that as a group we've agreed to um, address or start talking about. Um, and so um, day habilitation, obviously a very big topic, but we also brought up that acuity and career ladders and employment services are areas of interest. And so um, uh, since that meeting, there have been some internal discussions on what could feasibly be addressed in the next few months for fiscal year 24 and how these issues can start to be addressed. And unfortunately, also the difficult conversation of what needs to be pushed to future rate cycles. Um, next slide, please. So for day habilitation, um, the, um, the rates will be reviewed after data has been collected. Um, the last time we met, we had a data collection tool around and we got a lot of really good feedback. Um, and so we're going to adjust the collection tool based on that feedback um, and distribute for data collection. The current timeline is by June. Um, uh, the RAG in June, and then we'll be collecting data through June or mid-July. And Optimus will then aggregate and analyze that data to help inform the policy decisions prior to the August RAG meeting. So that's the current thinking on the timeline for um, collecting data on day habilitation. Any questions? Great. Um, next slide. Oh. I'm sorry. Can just I just looking at the timeline. I'm just wondering if that's going to really give enough time. Um, just, can you say one more time when you would expect the request for data to go out? Um, we are working as fast as we can to get it out as soon as possible. But we're our goal is to get it out by June. By June, like the, the June, sorry, the June um, R R A G meeting. So that would be until the seventeenth. Yes, and if we can get it out sooner, because we've already gotten that feedback from um, this group, we will, and um, we'll be collecting data through June and July. Yeah, that just you know, just you know, that is when you know fiscal people are very busy with the uh, change in the fiscal year. Um, I don't know if any of the providers want to speak to that, but I mean, I, I realize the timing I mean, is just difficult because, I, you know, it, when you think of when the, the data was collected from the fiats and how long it has taken um, to get, you know, what at the moment just feels like very minimal data. Um, I do worry about the Um, yeah, we can take that back and, and certainly revisit the timeline. Is this data for transportation? What data are you talking about? Um, so if you recall from the last meeting, we sent out that data tool that had just a very narrow scope of day habilitation, um, staffing ratio, and transportation. We're just hoping to collect that data, um, but we're going to adjust the, the template a little bit based on all, of that, um, all the really good feedback that we received. Thank you. Leslie, will we see that tool again? Because I know there was a lot of discussion and a lot of feedback, and I really can't recall what it looked like. But yeah, will we absolutely. see that again? Yes, absolutely. When we um, are done making the adjustments, and then we can send it out. Does that may help us determine the time the timeline? Because previously, the way the tool was set up, we was really concerned about the, the timeline but I can't recall all of the changes that were gonna be made and if that helps us with the ability to collect the data. Um, yeah, so are you talking about looking at the original tool again or um, no, no. the changes? Okay. No, just to see the, the one that has been changed. I see, yes. As, um, like I said, as soon as we are able to make those adjustments and um, we will send it out. Leslie, it's Chris. When you say you're going to send out that tool, is that going to go to this group before it's widely distributed, or will we see it when it's distributed to all the providers? Um, I think what we're going to do is 
take that back internally just because it depends on how extensive the changes are to the tool. We're still working through some of that feedback from last time. Um, and then depending on how extensive that changes, um, I think we'll make the decision from there. Okay, thanks, Chris, for clarifying that because that's what I was asking. <laughs> if we, if so, it's sorry, we misunderstood. The tool, <laughs> so, okay. the, so if that were to occur with with significant changes that you felt need to come back to the group, then that June June seventeenth distribution date goal was not really valid. Um, I yes. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and that's why I, I caveated with this is the current timeline that we're trying to work under, but um, obviously wanting to work with the group here and making sure that um, it's the right thing to do for providers. So, and this goes back to to the the bylaws and being able to address these type of issues in between meetings. Exactly. And just one other thing, I don't know that we could really address it through the data tool, but you know, one of the things that it has come up more and more as more time has gone by is, you know, and you know, things like Greg mentioning, you know, how significant inflation has been, which is comparing to PCIS revenue is becoming, I think, almost less and less meaningful. And what providers are really looking at is what's the adequacy of the new rate? Um, as opposed to the, we know the comparison to PCIS um you know we know that those rates have largely been inadequate but um you know whether the the new rates are getting us far enough along to be able to um actually provide quality supports really becomes the big question i, I yeah. would second laura's point too i mean the goal here was not to get back to break even uh, I mean, the goal here was to get sufficient rates to be able to pay the direct support professionals a adequate living wage. Uh, you know, so I mean, that, that's the ultimate goal. And I understand the budget constraints, but the, the purpose was to design a rate that we knew eventually would get us there and then look to the state to figure out how to fund it. Um, yes, thank you for that feedback. And we will take that back. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass this along if there's no more comments to um, the state so they can speak to uh, the next steps on acuity and employment services. Great. Thank you, Leslie. And um, th thank all of you for, for your uh, very productive comments this morning. Uh, I just wanted to say that the Maryland Department of Health and, and DDA appreciates, uh, and, and we also share in the commitment to ensuring that services appropriately support individuals with varying needs um, and do so, you know, in, in a flexible way. Um, in each of the categories of LTSS services, we've developed services and policies to support individuals with higher needs and or acuity. Uh, and just a few examples, um, for example, in residential, we have developed clear criteria for access to dedicated supports, um, as well as have enhanced rates for community living group home. Um, in day services, for example, I think we, as someone mentioned it earlier, we have individuals who can be supported with either one-to-one -one or two-to-one staffing ratios um, and individuals can use this billable service to participate with their staffing at large or small group activities. Uh, in addition, um, there's additional flexibility such as nursing and behavioral support services that can also be accessed to support individuals with, with, with higher needs. Uh, I think that gets to, to some of the stacking that um, Chris uh, from Optus mentioned earlier. Um, and as we transition to the new services and rates, we will continue to work together in future rate setting cycles uh, to assess the outcomes and the impacts of the new services and rates for individuals with higher needs and or acuity. And also, and I, and I really can't underscore the importance of this next point enough, um, just based on some of the conversations I've had with providers, which is, um, um, I know I've mentioned it before, I love having conversations with you all to find out exactly what's going on in your worlds and on the ground. 
it's important that you understand we remain a resource for you all and all providers to understand to use this new array of service flexibilities to meet a person's needs. Um, used to work with a colleague of mine, he was the chief medical officer, and he used to say, Robert, it's seven different times, seven different ways to get your point across or to make sure what you're communicating um, will hold. And I know we do a lot of webinars and at a glances and, and things like that, um, but we're all so very busy. And, and I think it's important um, that you know folks understand the policy, understand the rationale behind the flexibilities and how those can be used in this new fee for service environment. Um, and so I know we're running short on time, so I'm going to go ahead and hand the mic over to Bernie to talk a little bit about employment services. That's great. Thank you, Robert. Um, good afternoon, everybody. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, where we are with uh, employment. And some of you who are a part of this group and uh, were really uh, crucial with us back a few years ago when we were looking at uh, one of the guiding principles to do employment first in the state. Um, you know, we want to continue to work and make sure that people have the opportunities and training and support to build upon their talents or whatever. And knowing that, you know, at some point we will be moving to the community settings rule and should be offering people the opportunity for employment first and then, uh, you know, hopefully assist everybody with uh, getting into uh, employment services. So if you recall in July of 15, we had about 175 community stakeholders and multiple state agencies to try and re-energize uh, employment first because there was, uh, I think, an endeavor be a few years before that to say, uh, what is Maryland doing about uh, employment first? Uh, we know that in uh, August of 15 to June of 16, there were groups that were created to develop a strategic plan. Uh, there were seven work groups that worked on the employment first committee that led to changes in partnership. We had grants of national importance to assist us with technical assistance and to bring subject matter experts into Maryland and, you know, create good uh, public policies and support a transformation to assist people in moving uh, into the community and getting jobs. So, you know, as part of that, we need to go back and take a look at where what our employment services look like. And uh, as we move from the legacy services uh, into uh, the current uh, wave of services that we have that afford the availability, we need to go back and say, uh, are we really incentivizing a competitive in integrated employment? I mean, I just heard a comment a little while ago, I think it was Chris Parks that talked about, you know, we were here to take a look at, are we play, paying a good wage to people so that uh, we can start taking a look at, uh, you know, the, the attracting people to come into our, our uh, world of uh, DDA. And so we need to continue to look at customized uh, supported employment. Uh, we need a, a good funding model and we need to create uh, services that include uh, people with IDD who are not working full time. I think as as uh, was stated a little bit earlier, you know, we are a person centered planning. That's the way we do our business and we should continue to do that. So as you know, we move forward from our legacy services. I want to recommend to this group that we identify specific employment services that might be uh, presenting some questions or concerns. And, you know, as you can see on, on the slide, we're basically taking a look at uh, giving us feedback and what do we need to take a look at and what do we need to adjust as uh, we move forward. And, and uh, I should have probably uh, mentioned Donna's name about the person-centered planning because that's exactly what we're all about. Everybody on this, Greg talked about it earlier, Chris Parks did, Karen, et cetera. So, you know, this is what we're about. We're about this. And, you know, I also want to acknowledge uh, uh, Karen Lee, who's uh, part of this group and who was uh, working uh, greatly for uh, DDA as a, on the Employment First Initiative way back when and all of you who, uh, who participated in all of that. I mean, there's there, uh, enough praise can't go around for all of the great work that was done. 
Um, so with that, again, we'll look at the moving forward and, and how we do this and, uh, you know, are the rates sufficient? Uh, you know, what are the barriers and what are the recommendations to overcome any of those barriers, et cetera? Okay. Um, can I ask a question? It, are there, I know this is not a question that could, I don't think could be answered in the moment, but is it possible to consider um, any kind of sub, sub work groups of this group um, to do work in different areas? I know obviously we have to abide by the open meetings requirements, but I'm just wondering if, um, given how pressing some of the issues are, if it's something you know, the department would consider. So the the bylaws are going to um, contain a provision contemplating the potential formation of subcommittees. Um, especially, I think in rebasing years, we'll absolutely want to have subcommittees. So it's definitely subcommittees in general are something we are definitely contemplating. Okay. Um, yep. On a previous slide, they uh, made the comment that break even was somewhere around four hours. Where you run into difficulties is in employment because you often don't need four hours in a day to support somebody in employment. You may need you know, six hours in a week. Um, um, so I, as, you, as you look at employment, if, if you do a good job match, you don't need as many hours, but you sure as heck still need the service and how to how to cost that out. You know, you have the monthly, but it doesn't quite cover it. And employment, I speak to a lot of providers, really concerned about employment and um, why even get into it. So I'm, I'm real happy to see that you, you put that on there. Yes. And so, Shauna, I echo exactly what Scott has been saying to you related to employment. Yeah, this, All right, this, I'm going to ask you to make sure you get that in the Google Doc that we, so we address that and don't miss it here. And, and this is Robert, just just for clarity, for the record, um, what Chris articulated was not a break even point. Um, it, he was stating that based on our observations, folks who were delivering uh, in excess of four hours were seeing more positive. Uh, results from a revenue perspective. Thank, thank you, Robert. I missed on that. You're welcome. All right, we can go to the next slide, please. So uh, as was stated earlier, uh, and we're in total agreement that uh, we need to do something with the uh, DSP workforce uh, uh, and we all have the shared goals around recruitment and and retention, uh, not just the recruitment. I mean, that's it's great getting somebody in in the front door to your agent to the agencies and introducing them to the people that are providing supports and doing training. But you know, one of the areas that we need to do is as as I want to remain committed to having a, a competency based uh, workforce. So that you know, there's some long-standing uh, employment for people, as opposed to you know having high turnover rates or whatever. I mean, there's been studies that have been done out there that have basically said you know additional training and having the direct support professionals feeling uh, more comfortable uh, with uh, how to uh, react in situations and or whatever uh, basically have been uh, good. Uh, you know, we did a study, uh, I was involved in a study a few years ago where we used the college direct support and looked at the turnover rate in an agency before and then after the training. And, uh, you know, we gave them 25 cents an hour, uh, which really wasn't anything, but, you know, the turnover rate went down and all of the staff said it was because of the training. So I think we need to continue to take a look at our Maryland direct support professional a training consortium uh, that was a pilot that was uh, set up back a while ago and we need to continue to take a, a look at that and you know again have a, a good professional competent direct support workforce and 
you know, what we look like around long-term supports and services and competencies, and also looking at the National Alliance for Direct Support uh, Professionals uh, competencies, et cetera. So, you know, again, as we continue to, to move forward, you know, that uh, Maryland DSP Consortium has people from Laura Howell, uh, Max, uh, as well as DDA and Department of Labor and the Department of Disabilities and others, and we need to continue to look at the data and look at the way we're going to move forward with this. So, you know, with that, I think, you know, the recommendations would, that we have will be brought back to this group for future rate priority uh, areas to take a look at. And with that, I'll, I'll open up some uh, the discussion to uh, uh, Chris and, and to the group uh, around the, the current rate methodology. Hey Bernie, this is Greg. As you as you know at Penmar, we have a uh, we have a career ladders program that we've developed over the last six years, and we work with <clears throat> uh, NAADSB or NADSB as our as our um, national partner. We have almost a hundred people that have have become um, DSP certified, and what we have what we have seen is that our retention rate for people that have gone through that program is eighty six percent. Our retention rate for people who have not is about 50%. It works, it's doable, it's worthy of investment, and anything that me or my team can help you get something more statewide off the ground, we're, we're here to help. That's great, yep. And, and you know, again, you're, you're, you're proof, saying 86% versus 50, so it does work. I know that the um, consortium had a retreat, I think like two weeks ago, and they came up with a set of recommendations. And Greg, if you don't mind, I would love to pass uh, Penmar's name along. We're using the same competencies because uh, NADSP is using the uh, CMS competencies now. They've gotten rid of their own competencies and they're using the CMS competencies and the Maryland DSP training consortium also uses them. So it's all the same competencies. It's just the yep. curriculum that's different and that's not a problem. Great. So if, if there, who at your organization would love to be on the uh, Maryland DSP training consortium group? Well, start with Greg Miller and we'll figure it out from okay. there. Okay, perfect, thank you. And can I just add that I think, you know, I. Clearly, the data is clear that this makes a difference. Um, I would just want to make sure that it's both the the training requirements and the um, the cost and the cost for increased wages as people achieve those higher levels are included in um, the uh, the rate system. Well, if you recall, Laura, uh, I had that conversation way back when with a JBGA because my concern was. When you take someone out of, of the workforce uh, and put them in training around DSPs or anything else, uh, there's a cost to the agencies to say, okay, who's replacing that individual because I still have to do the supports. So that was built into the rate way back when. I mean, I think maybe we, need, we, need, we may want to go back and revisit that to see, you know, is that uh, replacement staff, for lack of a better term, uh, at a high enough rate so that we can afford to continue to train workforce and still have an agency uh, meet their obligations for what they signed off on in delivering the PS, uh, the person-centered plan. Right. I know you've been supportive. Um, the data might need a little freshening probably at this point, but um, I think the other pieces, you know, Bernie, I think uh, my memory of your original vision was that we build into the rate system a DSP-2, a DSP-3, but somewhere along the way we were told that um, where to look in the rate system for a rate for DSP-2, for example, was in the enhanced services. And I don't think we want only the enhanced services. I mean, clearly they have a higher, you know, um, uh, training needs, I think one could argue, but um, you know, I think we'd want to see that in, in across the board. Well, yeah, and we've talked about that, and I'm going to ask Chris to uh, to address that because uh, I'm with you. I mean, you know, if you come in and you're a DSP one, 
uh, you may be looking for a career advancement and there might not be any if you don't have it unless you go into, uh, you know, an enhanced service. And, you know, you might be happy working with the uh, individuals you're providing supports to and don't want to move someplace else within that agency. So, yeah, we need to have that flexibility. Yep. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I can just provide additional context there. Um, when we have these rates developed, you know, they're they're based off of a uh, a wage that's assumed. Um, that assumption uh, comes from DDA, and the wage is intended to represent a mix of individuals that are uh, providing that service. So, whether it be DSP ones or DSP twos, <laughs> excuse me. Um, you know, for example, if you had a fifteen dollar wage for a DSP one and a twenty dollar wage for a DSP two, and you have slightly more DSP ones providing that service, then you know the the wage that is built in might be let's say seventeen dollars or something like that. Um, and obviously, those are those are just mock numbers for representation. Uh, but the intent there is to have them blended um, for a uh, a mix that's expected. Um, so there are some pros and cons to that that we wanted to talk through um, and see if there's any ideas around that, if, if we're comfortable with that methodology or if there's any thoughts around that methodology. So, for example, if we have that blend in there, um, you know, from a purely financial perspective, if, if you're not taking into context necessarily uh, things like retention or turnover, you might be more incentivized to try to focus on only paying the lower wage uh, that might be below what the wage is that's built into the model. Um, because then you'd have uh, potentially a, a better revenue with fewer costs. Um, but that does come at the cost of things like retention. Um, so there's that issue with having it blended. Um, if we were to not have it blended, essentially you'd have to have a separate rate for uh, the level of training or certification uh, that each individual has. So for example, if you have a service that has a rate of you know twenty dollars. You you'd have to have two different rates. The service is twenty dollars, and another service is you know twenty four dollars or whatever it is um, for that same service that you're offering to split it out by uh, by the employee that's providing that service. So um, if you you know want to talk about potentially you know, splitting those out, that would be a significant increase in the number of, um, you know, services that are, uh, that you'd have to bill for, you know, gets a little bit administratively complex. If you want to, you know, uh, talk about the idea of having that blend and what are the appropriate rates uh, of wages that are in there and what are maybe the appropriate percentages, that's a, a separate way that we can go and, and see, you know, what do we think this should look like? What do we think it does look like? And how do we move forward from there? But just for that context, that's kind of how it's currently built in. And that's, um, you know, have some of those pros and cons of, of looking at different ways there. So I, I just want to make sure I understand what you just said. Are, are you suggesting that there is a blend that's already built into these rates for this type of career ladder and credentialing of DSPs? Are you saying that if we if we create an initiative, these are the two mech two ways to go at it? Um, I think it's uh, kind of both. Uh, so I think that the intent behind the wages that were selected is to represent uh, the the kind of an average of the range of wages that would be paid to those DSPs. Um, regardless of whether they're DSP-1 or DSP-2, it, it should be kind of a blended mix. That's the assumption that's built in. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not those assumptions are, you know, appropriate um, or how uh, that could be potentially revis revisited, those are options to look for, you know, in the future. So if that's something that um, we wanted to look at, okay, we understand the blend is built in there. Is that blend appropriate? You know, what are the wages? What is the kind of mix that we, we are expecting? That's one way to look at it. Or another way is to say, you know, we think that there should be a different rate um, for uh, people who have a higher level of, of certification or training. Um, so that's, we really wanted to just kind of provide that context and uh, solicit that feedback to see, you know, what is the intent? Uh, what is the expectation from the RRAG? Uh, what is the, I guess, the um, kind of guidance that you might provide on what you would uh, like to do with that? My, I think, 
Chris, I've kind of been involved in this discussion uh, for quite some time with DDA. We created the framework that was, uh, I think it was shared with your team recently um, through an RFP process. And I, I think that um, one of the problems with the glide path the way it is, is it's muted the differentiation in rates. And so um, they may be there in the core rate, but in the glide path and the percentages, as a result, they're muted and you can't really tell that there's that that it's an averaged rate. Um, the other problem is I, I think there wasn't necessarily uh, a lot of, um, when, when we started to do like the fiat and, and those kinds of things, in our mind's eye, we, we weren't recognizing that there were varied rates in there. So we looked at the rate as a, or, or at least the base rate or the base salary as a whole. I think either way would work. We can't, we don't want to mandate that people go through this training. Of course, what, you know, Greg has said, I think, um, and as Donna knows on, as a member of the consortium, we're at about 93% retention of our DSP2. So it's it's a really like pretty close to what, what Greg and his team are at. And this is this is over 300 per, uh, people across the state. So I think I think that you could do it either way. You could do a you know a, a code that's for when a DSP2 works or a code for when a DSP2 with a you know with a specialization works or a mentor or something like that. You could do that with a code or you could have the combined rate. Um, I think it just needs to be incredibly well communicated because some people might look at that rate and go, oh, look at this is such a great rate. We can pay all of our DSPs this rate and they may not choose to create a ladder in their organization despite the data that says it's a, it, it's a uh, more viable way of recruitment and retention. Um, recognizing that we don't ever want DDA to mandate it because then they would lose their the uh, the um, FMAP match for for it if it becomes mandatory. We don't want it to become mandatory. But um, so I think either way works. The public relations around it is going to be incredibly critical. Can I jump in, Chris? I um I think that. Um, and maybe this is part of what Karen is saying in terms of it being muted. I think that originally, you know, we're now in, I think, heading into year eight in terms of the discussions around rate setting. Initially, there was a lot of intensive discussion about building in the um, different levels of DSPs. I think having been part of this process the entire time, um, we would be hard pressed to point to analysis that built in assumptions around what it would um, take in terms of the BLS wage to achieve a blended rate to adequately incentivize, fund and incentivize um, career ladders. So um, I, I think, I, I definitely think if that's where we're going, there needs to be a really good look at this. I don't think it's there and can be tweaked. I think it maybe has to be built. And I, and the only other thing I would say is, I think that providers, I, there are pros and cons, but I think that providers, I'm not sure they would want the increased complexity in billing in terms of a DSP2 worked with somebody one day, but maybe not another day. I think um, I would think that they might lean towards a blended <clears throat> rate for that. Okay, yeah, I think that's really good feedback. Um, I think uh, I think you know we're in agreement there. There's there's um, probably not <clears throat> as much information as we'd like to have um, about what's currently built in in terms of like percentages and things like that. So that is something that you know if that's the interest of the group in. Uh, pursuing that information and seeing, you know, how that correlates to the assumptions that were built in, um, I think that's <clears throat> that's certainly a viable path. Um, and Karen, I I think that's a really great point um, around, uh, you know, disseminating that information around the communication and the PR, um, making sure that that uh, providers know that information up front so they can kind of uh, build in uh, appropriate, you know, wages. Um, 
for what their needs are uh, to kind of support that development. Um, but yeah, if, if that's, uh, that's kind of, I think how we were initially expecting things, it, it probably doesn't seem like a, a super feasible option to, uh, you know, double or triple the number of rates to be able to, you know, keep track of who's doing what when. Um, but without doing that, there is that blend. So it may be, uh, to Laura's point, something that we spend a little more time looking into what uh, wages are appropriate there and what kind of blends are appropriate there and, and how those compare to the current assumptions. And, and Chris, I guess maybe one question. You all did in the training, I know, have DSP you know, one and, and two level training assumptions. And so um, I think you know the other part of that is if you do a blended rate to make sure that it's consistent, because I know there were some assumptions around the training um, and then the proportion is DSP one and two, but I, I don't recall that being part of the rate methodology for the wages. So. It, I think it's better if we have some transparency and and I, I agree I think the option the other option and I've seen this in other states is is uh, kind of a separate add on um, if there is a, a higher level DSP um, uh, worker who has gone through that certification, you know, just add it on to great as an option. Yeah, I think that's really good feedback. We'll make sure that um, anything that we're doing, that that's the intent there is to have that consistency and transparency. All right, if we don't have any additional comments on career pathways, um, why don't we go to the next slide? Um, so again, thank you all for the discussion today. Um, I always appreciate um, all of the, the feedback and the expertise that you bring um, to the RREG. Um, to kind of recap our action items, our next steps um, that we're gonna take following this meeting, um, we are going to release a Google form that you all can use to request certain topics or presentations in the agendas for future meetings. Um, we are going to finalize the bylaws and share them with all of you once they're finalized. Um, we are going to share a link to updated fiat tool for providers' internal use as you try to manage all of these transitions that are happening um, and we will also ask you all to complete um, a Google form specific to employment services um, to provide us additional information on that area um, our next meeting is Friday June 17th again at 12 30 p.m. Um, and members of the public who would like to observe these meetings um, can register through the DBA training calendar through their constant contact event. Um, you only have to register once and you get reminders for each meeting. Um, meeting connection links are sent one day and one hour prior to the meeting and meeting minutes will be made available following the meeting. Um, and if you have any questions or would like to request accommodations for the meetings, please contact Donna Will. Um, on next slide, please. Jennifer, can I just ask real quick, is there an actual sure. date yet? Um, is, is it going to be that third, third Friday or do you think it'll be different? My understanding is the next meeting scheduled for the seventh for June seventeenth. Is that your question? No, the September date. Oh, September. No, we do not currently have a regularly scheduled meeting planned for September. Um, but if there are specific additional issues that we want to get feedback on at that time, that's when we will be doing that. Like we're, we have regular meetings planned through August, um, and then. September is kind of any final information gathering that we need to do. Okay, thank you. Sure. If we go to the, okay, we're on the right slide now. 
Um, upcoming additional meeting dates, as I said before, Friday, June 17th, Friday, July 15th, and then Friday, August 19th. Go to the next slide. Um, we have the link that you can use to view all of the meeting materials, which are made available through the designated DBA webpage for the advisory group. All right, so thank you all again for attending. Um, and we look forward to continuing the discussion on June 17th. Jennifer, it's Chris. Yes. Real quick, just you, you added a couple items, I guess, really to what I would consider the parking lot, the Google form, the bylaws, the updated fiat tools mm -hmm. and employment services. Are we able to add some things to that too? I mean, there's items in here I'd like to see some follow-up on. Uh, specifically, the breakout of the fiat tool, the gains and losses by program, I think are critical. I would also like to see an analysis of the day provider components for the type of individuals they're serving, specifically whether or not they're heavy one-to-one. -one, uh, is that leading to gains or is it non, you know, without one-on-ones, we're losing money. And then uh, just uh, parking lot, the transportation tool, the revised transportation tool, in, in case we are not at the point. Uh, where it's been distributed to providers yet. Uh, I would appreciate those three things if we can put them in the parking lot to make sure we follow up on them. Got it. Yep, we will definitely appreciate take that. that back. Fantastic. Thank you, ma'am. Sure. All right. So with that, thank you all again, and we will talk next month. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a great weekend. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.